Good morning again. Thank you, Allison, for that reading. And I don't know how many of you sort of had a vision in your head of a solitary person just walking through the woods. And somehow this is the moment when you have a change of experience and become in touch with the divine that is part of all of nature and all of the world. And that moment, that experience is incredibly important in our Unitarian Universalist tradition. If you look at our sources from which we draw insight about that which we call the divine, the first one is the direct experience of the transcendent. And so we hold that the person's experience of the divine is the most important one. No book, no tradition, no teacher should take precedence. Doesn't mean the others aren't important, but if your experience tells you that something is different, that something is somehow wrong in what you were taught, we say your experience comes first. And that is part of that image we, uh, Colin talked about earlier about independence. That I, you, each of us as the people that we are, are all different. And we can each experience that which is holy in our own ways. And they are all true. That's not the only thing we talk about when we talk about independence. In that reading about nature, Emerson then also talks about how he's wandering in the woods and as he's having that experience, suddenly the people in his life he feels separated from. His family, the friends, even people he feels like are brothers can't be as important as this experience that he's having. And that is also bound up in this thing we call independence, that somehow that solitary experience, that emotional place is somehow the seat of, of a strength, a knowledge, an experience that we don't get when we share with other people. And that last part is the part that's the problem. That last part is the one that keeps us from connecting. It's that part that makes us ignore or turn our backs on those who would offer us support and care. And it's not the only way in which independence can harm us. It's actually a really important stage in any of the theories of what they call sort of the theories of the self. That moment when as a young person, at whatever age you do it. I mean, in my family, we start early. My middle sister by the age of two only had two answers to requests. It was either no or I do. She was two and she was already working on that independence thing. Other people, it's their teenage years. They're trying to say, I am my own person. I am separate. I am different. And it is present in all different levels of our society. So not just the self, but can we, can our towns be on their own? Can our states be on their own? Should our country be on its own, this idea of independence? In fact, that holiday we celebrated yesterday is, that is the 4th of July, is the Declaration of Independence. But it's not when independence actually started. It's when we declared the intent to be separate. Everything else came later. The battles, the wars, the treaties, the first constitution, the failure of that first government, the second constitution, and we had help. We had the French helping, we had others helping. 
but we celebrate that day as that declaration of the wish for independence without ever going back and thinking about, well, what was it that actually happened next? Who did we rely on? How did we do that together? And what did we intend to do as a nation after? I must say, I didn't really think about this whole issue of independence like that at all until I was reading Catherine Keller's From a Broken Web. Now, I said earlier that most of the theories of the self rely on this idea of differentiation, finding out how you as a self are different from every other self, including the ones who shaped you and molded you and who you love. And as Catherine Keller, who was writing a feminist theological reflection on the theories of the self, who said that part of that story of independence is only achieved when a person who's on top of a pyramid of people on whose labor and lives they depend and they can ignore all the people on whom they depend. They're not independent. They just can't admit that they are dependent on not only just one person, but hundreds and thousands of other people. Usually what we really mean by independent is there's nobody higher than us on the ladder who can tell us what to do or whose financial support we need. But that's always an illusion. There are always hundreds or thousands of people whose work and lives are bound up in ours, who grows the food, who tills the soil, who raises the animals, who brings them to market. During this COVID time, some of the hardest shortages were really caused by the fact that we don't even know how many separate links of separate chains are needed to get things from where they're grown to where the food gets made, to when it actually gets to us. I mean, we had a pasta shortage because of distribution networks and wheat issues. I don't know how many of you went to the store and realized there's no pasta there. Well, that was one of those breakdowns of those chains that we don't think are there. And that's one of those dreams we tell ourselves. When you're a kid, I mean, I certainly, like I love my parents, but I was so ready to go out in the world and find out who I was on my own, who I was when I wasn't with them. And I still love my parents, but now I can see which parts of me are from them and which parts of me are new just because they're me. And most of us go through that. We go through this period of wanting that independence. But at that same time, that can be an illusion. As I said, I keep using that word illusion, but it's a dream. And oftentimes there are people who cut themselves off from emotional support, from friends, from connections, because they somehow think there's a value to being able to do it on their own instead of actually needing another person. And that dream is partially due to those beginnings way back with Emerson. So we started with Emerson in the woods experiencing the divine in nature and suddenly feeling so very distant from all the people in his world. And that's that vision we have in our head of what it means to be independent. But then I learned about his life and realized that's not actually how he lived his life. And if the person who helped fuel this dream for so many did not live that life, we need to really grapple with what that life was like and what it could tell us about what we can do instead. So many of you know that you know, Emerson was a writer 
um, way back then, um, you know, in the 1830s, 1840s, it, not a lot of people could buy books. One, not a lot of people could read. Not a lot of people had extra money with which to buy books. So he actually didn't make most of the money he needed to support himself and his family. And yes, he had a wife and, and three children um, and a house to keep up. At one point, they even tried to turn their house into a boarding house to see if that would help. So he was always trying to figure out how to support the family. And what he would do is give lectures because while lots of people couldn't read and couldn't buy books, people could go and listen and learn something. So there was this whole lecture circuit that existed at that time. It was called the Lyceum Network, the Lyceum Lectures. You can think about it as really early TED Talks. So there's no cameras, there's no recordings, but they would go from town to town because like, yo, now we give a TED Talk, everybody gets on the cameras and we can all see it all over the world. There, the speaker had to go from town to town to town to town to town, having people hear that lecture. And Emerson could travel all over, you know, America, which was a much smaller country back then. Um, you know, he could go to Mass, you know, he was in Massachusetts, he could go to New Hampshire or Connecticut. He could go all the way to what was the wilds of Ohio back then and still come home fairly frequently. And so he could be connected with his home, be connected with his family and provide for his family. But then he had a chance for something that he never had a chance before. They wanted him to go and do a lecture series in Europe. So now Europe, one, he'd never been to Europe. So that's exciting. New places, all these places he'd read about and heard about, he could go. There's people to meet, people whose books he's read, whose thoughts had inspired him. And people who've never heard him. New people to hear his messages. But at the time, to get to Europe, you need to take a ship. And then once you're there, it's more boats or coaches. It took a long time to get anywhere. There's no trains. There's no channel. So when he started looking at this tour of Europe to give speeches, which could be a great opportunity for him and for his professional life, you're talking, it could be two years that he would be away. And back then, only men were allowed to take care of the money things. Literally, his wife could not go to the bank and do anything with the accounts. Women were not allowed. So there needed, if he was gonna go away for two years, he needed somebody to take care of the actual running of his family. Somebody needed to take care of it. And this man who we imagine alone in the woods went to his friend, who's Henry David Thoreau, who we, even more, the man known for living alone in the woods. He wrote On Walden Pond. And when we delve into Thoreau's life, we learn all sorts of things about his connections in day-to-day -day life that let us know that On Walden Pond is its own myth story. But this problem for Emerson shows us how huge this image of him and of Thoreau is wrong, of them being independent and separate who don't depend on anyone. Because when Emerson goes to Thoreau and says, there's this trip to Europe, this chance to go speak, I need to be away. Thoreau, who lives on his own in the woods, 
moves in to Emerson's house and takes care of Emerson's family for at least two years, if not even longer. Those trips could be very, very long. And can you imagine what it means to be so close to someone, to be able to rely on them to step up and completely overhaul their life and the way they live their life for at least two years for their friend and have that be something that is just part of that friendship. So these people that we have in our head as these avatars of independence were completely interdependent. They relied on each other. They talked together, they thought together, but they also supported each other in ways we can't imagine. But think about all the times, maybe in your own life, you have tried to do it alone and just felt like, I can't, it just doesn't happen, something's wrong. Something must be wrong with me because I can't do it alone. Well, guess what? It's because it's one of those big stories we tell ourselves that's not actually true. The people who we base those imaginings on, their writings, that's not who they were. They were people who depended on the people who mattered to them and were people who could be depended upon to step up in ways big and small. So I share this to show how that idea we have of independence hides a truth about interdependence. So what do we do? What do we do with that? When we think about this day, when we think about what we mean by that 4th of July and that Declaration of Independence, when we think in our minds about what it means to seek the truth in our own selves, what if, as Emerson's life shows, it really means we need to find the people to whom we are connected and build strong enough relationships that we depend on one another and consider that the normal part of life. There's nothing in his writings that made it seem like Emerson thought that was a really big thing to ask his friend. There's nothing in what Thoreau writes that made it seem like he had any second thoughts at all. They just depended on each other. And if we take that story, that story of emotional connection, of interdependence, interconnection, and try to let that old ideas of what being independent means, and imagine it being an interdependent self, an interdependent person with a whole network of people. could change a life. I'm still struggling to get over my deeply ingrained images of somehow trying to do it all on my own. Maybe some of you have done that too. I hope we might all, as we think about where that desire for the individual hurts us, not just individually, but collectively in our common life, in our public life, in our governmental life. What would it mean if we acknowledge that we are all in this together and we all need one another? And may we find our ways to see that we are part of an interdependent web that is not just the world we think of as nature, but all human society is its own web that is also part of that natural world. 
we just build our own houses instead of requiring the conch shells that the damselfish use. Thank you so much for being here today. And I hope you find ways that you are connected to people you never knew you were connected to before. And that you can come to celebrate the interdependence of all of us. And one day, may our country understand that Interdependence Day might serve us an awful lot better than Independence Day.